OK, bonjour à tous et à toutes. Uh, je m'appelle Catherine Crosters et je suis la présidente d'un groupe de travail sur l'avenir du doctorat en histoire pour la Société historique du Canada. Nous parlons de notre travail à Congrès, mais en parlant avec le comité des étudiants diplômés de la Société historique du Canada, nous avons décidé d'abréger cette série de webinaires sur les carrières en histoire. My name is Catherine Kersters, and I'm leading the CHA Task Force on the Future of the History PhD in Canada. Um, task Force members are going to be giving a progress report at the upcoming CHA annual meeting. But today we're delighted to host the first of three webinars on careers for History PhD graduates. Will Langford is a member of the committee and is my co-animateur for the webinar today. Um, before turning it over to him, I want to give a brief land acknowledgement, as will all of our presenters, since we're all coming from different places today. Um, I'm coming to you from Guelph, which is on the treaty lands of the Mississaugas of the Credit, and today, of course, is the home of many Indigenous peoples. I would like to express my gratitude to my many Indigenous teachers and colleagues at the University of Guelph and elsewhere who have taught me so much about the history of this land and our complex history of colonialism. Um, we'd love for everyone to say hello in the chat, um, giving us a sense of which Indigenous territories and universities that everyone is coming from. So I'll turn it to you, Will. Merci, Catherine, et bienvenue à tous. Um, comme Catherine vous a signalé, uh, je m'appelle Will Langford, et je, je suis parmi les sept membres uh, du groupe de travail sur l'avenir du doctorat uh, en histoire au Canada. Et je suis professeur adjoint à Dalhousie University, dont je vous parle en proximité de Chipocto, le grand port qui est situé en Mimagni, le territoire non cédé des Mima. Uh, my name is Will Langford. I'm one of the seven members of the CHA's task force on the history, uh, on the future of the history PhD. And uh, I teach history and sustainability at Dalhousie University. And so I'm within a rock's throw of Shibukto, the Great Harbor, which is situated in Mi'kma'ki, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq. And given the subject of today's discussion, maybe I'll just add that I'm a limited term professor. Uh, in today's webinar, we're joined by five recent PhD graduates who, since completing their dissertations, have taken up different kinds of work in the private sector. And you're going to see in upcoming seminars, which are going to be held on April 27th and May the 5th, uh, you'll hear from PhD graduates who also work in government, university, and public history institutions. What we're going to do today is that Catherine and I will introduce each speaker in turn. They'll have about 10 minutes to talk about what their current job is like, um, how they made their way into their career, and what tips they may have for others who are looking to pursue a similar uh, career direction with their historical training. And that'll leave about half an hour for everyone in the audience to pose some questions uh, in the chat and we'll hopefully have a, a rich discussion. Nous accueillons aujourd'hui uh, cinq titulaires de doctorat en histoire qui travaillent actuellement dans le secteur privé. Et chacun d'entre eux vont vous parler pendant environ 10 minutes de leur métier, comment ils sont entrés dans leur carrière et quels conseils ils ont pour euh, des gens qui veulent euh, suivre une orientation pareille. Et après les prestations, on aura environ euh, une demi-heure pour poser des questions. Et nous vous invitons euh, de participer en français ou bien en anglais, uh, comme vous voulez. Uh, le séminaire ne sera pas complètement bilingue, mais on va se déployer. Um, we're inviting everyone to participate as, uh, in either official language, and we better do that because we have a historian with us today in Serge Dupuis, who's actually written a book about the history of linguistic duality in Canada. So we're doing our best. Uh, without any further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first presenter, who's Herward Longley. He secured a PhD uh, from the University of Alberta right at the end of 2020. And he's an environmental historian 
whose dissertation focused on the history of bitumen extraction and its environmental, social, and political consequences on, uh, you know, in Cree, Dene, and Métis territory in the Athabasca region. Herward is now working as the lands and culture lead at Two Worlds Consulting in Vancouver. And there he's able to draw on his uh, experience with uh, Indigenous lands and knowledge, community engaged research, and projects that, that he's been doing for a diverse set of clients, uh, Métis, First Nations, industry, and in government. So Herod Long, uh, Longley est un historien de l'environnement et de la territoire et connaissance autochtone qui travaille pour uh, Two Worlds Consulting à Vancouver, sur, surtout sur les dossiers qui concernent l'évaluation environnementale. So, Herward, we're glad to have you with us. Thank you, Will. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for the invitation. Um, yeah, my name is Herod Longley. I'm joining from uh, Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Territory in uh, Vancouver, BC. Um, so yeah, as Will mentioned, uh, I'm currently working uh, for Two Worlds Consulting, which is an Indigenous-owned um, social and environmental consultancy. And we, uh, we provide impact assessment uh, and engagement services for, um, for the, uh, for Indigenous nations, government, and industry proponents. Um, and so a lot of what I've been working on recently is uh, implementing the new uh, impact assessment uh, and the BC Environmental Assessment Acts, and specifically the components of those that require a much higher uh, bar for um, engagement and consensus seeking with Indigenous nations. Um, and the uh, and looking for ways to ensure that indigenous knowledge is informing the impact assessment process. Um, and so yeah, it's been a, I've been I started working here in uh, but it's been about a year and a half now. It's whipped by pretty quick. But um, yeah, it's just been a fantastic transition and I'm really loving every every bit of it. Um, and then yeah, and my my PhD research uh, was about uh, the oil sands industry. Um, and that was partially um, collaborative uh, community based research with the uh, Fort McMurray Métis. Um, and so that was that that links into a bit of my consulting experience now. But um, yeah, so I was like working with them. And some of that was academic work. And some of that was work for for the nation. And um, that uh, that gave me a bit of a background. Um, but yeah, a bit about how I got into consulting generally, because it's not a new uh, thing for me. I've actually been, I was looking at my CV earlier, and like, I think the earliest consultant -y sort of thing I did was in 2012. Um, but yeah, I basically have, I've always been interested in the, in the issue around, um, like, resource extraction in, in Canadian history, you know, it goes back for as long as this country has existed and how Indigenous pe peoples have been affected by that and participated in it and challenged it. And so I, I've, I, I'd say I've been more interested in that issue than I have been in either in how I position myself within that. So whether that's in academia or consulting or whatever, so that the, the focus has always been on the issue. And so um, I've had some really amazing um, opportunities that have been uh, set up by colleagues and supervisors uh, in the past. So um, uh, my first real job was working for uh, for Peter Fortna, actually, who's an, who's another uh, historian, and he uh, worked he worked for a company, uh, or he he owns a company called Willow Springs Strategic Solutions. So he gave me my first job, and my connection with. Um, with McMurray Métis, and that was actually set up by supervisors, my, by my supervisors. So that was really awesome, and that kind of got me in the door. Um, after that, I worked and I worked for him for a couple of years, and then I worked independently for McMurray Métis for a while, and then recently joined um, Two Worlds. Um, and so, yeah, it's just been uh, it's been an amazing uh, an amazing journey. Um, and so getting into a bit of like what uh, I would recommend to uh, to people who are interested in a in a similar path is um, uh, is look for look for ways that you can connect and engage with contemporary versions of your issue from a very early stage in your academic work. Um, 
So uh, that means looking for looking for conferences, looking for work opportunities. You know, if you can get a uh, you know an internship, a co-op placement, uh, a research contract, a part time. Um, a part-time job, like whatever it is, just start building that CV. Um, I'm quite involved in the hiring side now, and it's there's a lot of people that come through that have a lot of interest and a lot of interesting, um, you know, academic uh, background with no work experience. And it's like it's it quite frankly, it's way too risky for us to hire people like who don't have a lot of demonstrable research and. We've been in a situation where we have a lot of people with like potential, but not enough experience, and that can I, that can go well, but it can also not. And so it's um, so look for ways to to start building that CV and gaining that experience early. Um, learn how to write fast and short. So uh, being able to write big, deeply researched documents is certainly an asset in impact assessment. Um, but ninety percent of what you do is going to be really fast, really short. It's still got to be. It's still got to be deep and sharp, but it's got to be it's got to be it's got to be tight. Um, uh, I think conferences and teaching can be a really great thing to do when you're in uh, your your program because it gives you a lot of experience with public speaking and making slide decks. Um, and uh, you know, look, making sure that you're under that 15 minute limit is really important as well. Um, and then a few other things are um, you know group work and collaborative authorship, something historians are uh, very averse to doing, but collaboratively authoring articles and stuff is a great way of doing it. Um, and this, I was, I was chatting with one of my senior colleagues uh, right before this, Erin, and she's, uh, she's got a lot of uh, somewhat scathing criticism for uh, academics she's worked with um, recently, but um, her, a direct quote from her was, get rid of your precious ego and perfect idea. They're not going to dominate uh, and are not going to survive a group editing process. Um, that was an, uh, that was one from her. And then another thing that she was talking about was, um, you know, really understanding business logic. And this applies to the private sector, but it also applies to any organization. So um, understand how your biz, your organization works. Um, who who is how are people getting compensated? How are they getting rewarded? How does the business make money? Is it from um, from billing clients? Is it from government grants? Um, because everyone is working for something, and you need to understand what that something is and whether or not you want to be a part of it. Um, and then also you need to be thinking about who the competitors are of a, of a consultancy or a company or whatever, and how the, the people that you're looking at working with um, differentiate. Um, a few things about, a few other things that are good about academia is that like, uh, is task ownership. Um, being a, do, getting through a master's or a PhD teaches you uh, a, a quite a high level of humility from getting your work destroyed over and over by revisions um, and still persevering and chipping away at it and getting through, and that's an invaluable quality. Um, uh, deep research and rigor and the opportunity to explore deep questions is really valuable. Um, and uh, However, there's a number of bad habits from academia. These are these are also from, um, or I'd say bad habits from bad academics, just to be a bit nicer about it. But again, from my colleague, um, so don't uh, don't wed yourself to being right. Uh, don't engage in fruitless debate. Um, avoid uh, hair splitting, grandstanding, um, insisting on the principle of a situation versus understanding the reality, uh, not backing down on ideas. Um, and uh, unfortunately, taking academic credentials too seriously. Um, in her words, this uh, academic work and publications and things like that and in, in the private sector are often icing and not cake. Um, and so I think uh, another really important thing is just getting a very uh, wide range of um, experience writing lots of different things. So like reports, memos, briefs, all that stuff. But um, I think the at the end of the day though, um, there are a lot of really fascinating opportunities that you can make um, really valuable contributions to uh, really important issues that have deep historical roots. Um, and, uh, you know, in my experience, I've been able to find that, like, you know, I'm, I feel like I'm contrib contributing to um, the contemporary version of like an of a very old historical problem. Um, and my historical knowledge of that has deepened my understanding and given me um, insights that some others might not have. Um, 
and so yeah i'd uh, encourage you all to um yeah think about this as a parallel rather than like a divergence from an academic path so yeah thank you um thank you very much for the opportunity to speak that was fascinating Howard. thank you so much um, our next speaker today is Alice Glaze, um, who I know from the University of Guelph. Um, she graduated from there in 2017. She's a social historian of the early modern period whose dissertation used court records and wills to look at the ways um, women played critical um, family work and legal roles in a 17th century town that neighbored Edinburgh. Um, she is currently the research director at No History, a historical research firm known especially, but not only for its research. Um, oops, <laughs> sorry, I just lost my notes with, that, with the slide share. <laughs> so sorry, Alyssa's work um, involves historical research and applying digital humanities tools, including database design, GIS, and social network analysis. Um, Alice Glaze est une historienne sociale de l'Écosse qui travaille à Ottawa comme directrice de recherche à No History, une compagnie de recherche historique. Um, Alice, welcome. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Sorry for the confusion as I tried to share my screen. Um, so my name is Alice Glaze. I'm a research director with uh, No History Historical Services. Um, I'd like to begin um, by acknowledging that the land where I live and work is the unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples, the traditional stewards of these lands and waters. Um, at this talk, I'm going to go over a bit about my career path, how I ended up as a research director. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about historical um, research firms in general, because it's something that I didn't know a lot about when I was a student, and, um, and then go over some of the things that we look for at No History in prospective employees and how some of the skills you, you develop in your MA and PhD um, can be used to your advantage when um, on the career hunt in the private sector. Um, so my uh, career path, there we go. Um, I did uh, my undergraduate and my master's at the University of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon. Um, when I was finished, I wasn't totally sure what I wanted to do, but I knew I definitely didn't want to do a PhD. Um, so I ended up working um, out in BC um, in a used bookstore, did a few different odd jobs, ended up in Ottawa working for a historical, a different historical research firm. Um, eventually decided that the one thing I did actually want to do was a PhD. Um, so I, I went to University of Guelph um, and uh, completed my, my PhD in 17th century Scottish history. Um, I also did some kind of digital humanities work as well um, as part of that, so database development, some social network analysis as well. Um, I saw a job posting with no history on a Facebook group and, um, and applied for a three month contract and uh, five years later I'm, I'm still here, um, so it, it worked out well. Um, I moved from first as an associate, uh, then a senior associate, and then in 2019 I became a research director with the company. Um, so as research director, um, I'm one of the a few in the firm. Um, my role involves both leading um, my own projects, generally projects that either have a large archival research component or a data analysis component, um, but also uh, supporting other project leads to ensure that projects run smoothly, um, that they're successful, answering research questions, um, trying to find solutions to problems like the archives are closed because of COVID. How do we pivot? I know everyone hates the word pivot. Um, everyone's sick of it by now. But uh, um, th those kinds of, of issues. So I quite enjoy the, uh, the diversity that, that um, in my workload in, in the day to day. Um, so that's kind of, and I'm happy to chat more about the details of being a research director if people are interested in the Q&A afterwards. In terms of historical research firms, they do exist. Um, they, it does seem like a bit of a unicorn job. Um, there are a few different firms out there. Um, many of them are in Ottawa, but they are found across, uh, across Canada. Um, they often specialize in either a type of a, an area of work or working with a specific group of people or organizations. So some historical research firms focus on litigation research, um, others work on more like heritage consultation or house histories, that, that type of work. 
Um, they often work with governments, either settler, settler colonial governments or indigenous nations um, when, uh, when working through, through contracts. Uh, and they can hire either with kind of slower long-term goals or um, as is often, or at least sometimes the case with kind of shorter term reasons, like a large temporary contract. So you might see a, a big hire come um, or a big job posting come in from a historical research firm. Um, in terms of no history specifically, um, we have two offices, one in Ottawa and one in Calgary, and then quite a few remote staff as well. Um, we have around 70 staff in total. Um, our motto is, is research, document, share. And so that really describes what we do. We, we focus on um, researching and documenting, whether that's through archival research or oral histories, um, uncovering um, the past, and then sharing it, finding interesting ways to, to share that past with, with audiences. One thing that I think is really interesting about working in a historical research firm uh, is that it's, it's always someone else's dream. So people come to us with something that's really important to them that they, they want us to work on, that they're going to invest time and money into getting a, a superior product about, and we get to help them facilitate that versus um, things like working in a museum where the content, the project is all very much decided in-house, but we, we get kind of new contracts every day with different ideas, different products, different, uh, different scopes. So that's really interesting. We also pride ourselves on hiring staff with strong research and writing skills. Um, so all or nearly all of our staff have MA level or higher education in history, Canadian studies, indigenous studies, that kind of thing. Um, another thing that, um, that Herward touched on as well is that it's very collaborative um, at our firm and I think in, in other historical research firms that it's not something that you expect, but you do a lot of teamwork. It's very much a team effort to get projects out the door, which I really love about my work. Um, it's not that kind of um, isolated feeling that you can sometimes feel in, in academia. So the, the camaraderie of the, of the office is really great. Um, one thing uh, is that team members can often end up specializing in a variety of skills at our firm. Um, so archival research, report writing, project management, um, oral history, videography, traditional knowledge and land use studies, um, GIS, data visualization, you can, as you work um, for different projects, you can kind of build up things, often building on maybe skills that you developed in your PhD. You can um, continue them in this field. Um, some of the things that we look for are in terms of like tips and tricks for, for students thinking about moving into the private sector and specifically with um, historical research firms. Um, first, the caveat that I'm, I'm not directly involved in hiring new staff. I will provide the email address of um, the human resources team at the end of this, but um, the, uh, my perspective is a bit removed, but I have a sense of who gets hired and why we're excited about having them. And so I can share that, that side of things. Um, as I said before, it's a standard that we look for in terms of having people with at least a, a master's and quite a few of us at the firm have a PhD as well. Um, so some of the skills that we look for um, in terms of employees where a, a PhD would be an advantage. Um, one is expertise in a specific study area, especially for us uh, Indigenous history or Canadian history. Um, as, as I just mentioned, I have a PhD in 17th century Scottish women's history, so thankfully for me, the list does not end there. There are other considerations as well. Um, we do really look for and respect demonstrated um, archival research experience. It is definitely an asset in, at my firm to have uh, conducted research in multiple archives, to be comfortable with archival research, um, or uh, to be really comfortable with oral history or traditional land use and knowledge studies, kind of having that demonstrated research experience is, is very helpful. Um, also demonstrated writing and communication skills, and especially the ability to write to different audiences. It is helpful to have that kind of academic tone and style, but it is very helpful to have that, um, I forget how Howard uh, mentioned it, but kind of that quick and deep, but also fast and, uh, and short is, uh, is really helpful to be able to be engaging to public facing audiences as well. Um, another one that we look for is project management skills. Um, so I feel like 
the experience of a PhD can be really helpful in developing this. The PhD students really understand the life cycle of a large project from planning to research to writing to having everything thrown out the window in revisions, um, understanding timelines and workload management, um, grant writing, quality assurance of your data, all of those things are really important skills that um, would serve you well as a, as a project leader or a project manager. Um, we also look for things that are kind of add-on skills or other skills, um, things that might set you apart from other candidates. So um, again, I feel like PhDs often allow for some exposure to different skill sets like um, oral history, data analysis, mapping, web design, anything related to digital humanities. Some of those skills um, can really help you get an edge in, in your resume or in your cover letter to kind of showcase those, those skills that other candidates might not have. So I think that's that's been really helpful. In terms of any sort of tips and tricks, the only ones I could really come up with were to uh, break your PhD down into its competent skills. So think about research, think about writing, think about management, um, think about kind of contacts that you might have or, or other ways that you can kind of build that skill set. Um, and to think about identifying some ways that set you or your project apart based on those skills that you've developed or how your, your specific project was different from others and how that could really be used to, to leverage something in, in, a, in the career end. Um, so those, the, that skill set around you know, data or contacts, or maybe it's something in the methodology, or maybe it's something in the final product that can be used that, that can be really helpful. Um, and the final one is that informational interviews are often very helpful, even if you don't end up working with that company or decide that it's not the right fit, but just getting those contacts and understanding what they're about, what companies are looking for, how things might fit fit later has been, that, that tends to be really helpful. Um, so thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My email address is there. Again, if you have anything more specific to hiring, um, I have put in the, the email address for our um, human resources team as well. But thank you so much. Thank you, Alice. That was terrific. And uh, there's plenty there, I think, uh, to enrich our discussion and to lead to some further questions in the question period. Uh, we're going to pivot now uh, to Saskatoon, uh, where we're joined by uh, Jessica DeWitt, who is an environmental historian, editor, writer, and digital communications strategist. Um, she got her PhD from the University of Saskatchewan in 2019. And her dissertation took a comparative approach to look at the development of parks, both in American states and Canadian provinces, all the way across the 20th century. And her research uh, methodology is also notable. She used visualizations to interpret various kinds of qualitative and quantitative information. And since graduating, she's foregone looking for tenure track employment and instead uh, been self-employed. And she is the editor in chief and social media editor of Niche, which is the network in Canadian uh, in history and environment. But she's also working with a variety of clients and those include the White Cap Dakota Na First Nation and the Canadian Association for Learned Journals. Jessica DeWitt est une historienne de l'environnement et une travailleuse indépendante à Saskatoon dans le domaine de communication numérique. So hello and welcome Jessica, over to you. Hello everyone, I'm glad my internet went out. So I had to switch over to my phone, so I'm glad I'm back uh, in time. Uh, as uh, Will mentioned, I'm in Saskatoon, which is on Treaty 6 territory. Um, it's the homeland of the Métis and it's the traditional territory of the Cree, Diné, Soto, uh, Nakoda, Lakota, and Dakota. Um, yeah, so <laughs> I, um, as Will mentioned, I am self-employed. That's the track that I've gone on and, and I currently hold six different contracts. So I have six different titles and job uh, descriptions. Um, and they're all very, they're, they're interconnected, but they're pretty different as well. So I thought I'd do a quick rundown of what I do on a daily basis because I work on three to five projects a day. So I'm doing an hour here, two hours there. 
um, and I have a long task list. Um, firstly, I'm, uh, I work for the Network in Canadian History and Environment. I'm our first paid employee. Um, and uh, so I'm the editor in chief there as well as social media editor. And I've been the social media editor since my third year of my PhD in 2014, which is uh, part of the reason that I was able to take this path. Um, and then as editor in chief, I just, um, I manage our scheduling of our posts, what's being published on the site. I review all the publishings. I, I copy edit them and I do technical aspects in the back pages such as um, keywords and excerpts and those kind of things that are going to help your search engine optimization. Um, I also work for White Cap Dakota First Nation. Um, I've been a project manager and um, historical researcher for uh, their Rebuilding Dakota First Nations uh, project, um, which is a project where they're um, rebuilding kinship and learning about their genealogy. So I've done a lot of genealogical uh, research for them. Um, I worked with uh, some No History Associates a couple of years ago on this work. And we hold workshops where we bring in elders and we bring in, we're just compiling all this knowledge. And also I'm working on tracing their ancestors across the U.S. border because um, the Dakota came from the U.S. in the 1860s. Um, <clears throat> so that's what I do there. <laughs> I'm also the Heritage Project Coordinator right now because I got that title because my supervisor for the other stuff is on leave. So they tack that on. And then I work for the Canadian Association of Learned Journals. So this is a nonprofit that represents all of the learned journals in Canada. And I do the communications for them. So I do social media. I do their newsletters. I do their website. I'm going to be building a new website for them soon. Um, what else? I, I work for the Shakuna Institute for Psychedelic Plant Medicines, and that's where I do um, digital strategies and editing. So again, much like what I do at Niche, I edit blog posts. So much of what I do there is similar to Niche. So, you know, editing for writing for a broad, broader audience. I do um, search engine optimization for their website. Um, so I learned how to, you know, work with Google figure out how to get people to find your website through search results. Um, <clears throat> and finally, I work for the Medical College of Georgia as a digital conference consultant and social media consultant. And I have worked with them on two different digital conferences so far, and they just renewed my contract for another year to plan another, at least one more digital conference with them. Um, so that's like what I'm doing right now. And that doesn't include workshops and other like one-off things that I've been doing. It's a bit different from what other people do in that I do a bit of everything and I don't know if it's for everyone, right? Um, a lot of people hear what I do and they think it's really overwhelming. Uh, for me, I, I thrive in it um, and I really enjoy it. Um, so how did I get here? <laughs> um, firstly, as I mentioned, I started being the social media editor for Niche in 2014. Um, and I quickly realized that I really loved it. I loved learning how to communicate to a broader audience. I loved the statistics behind it. I loved learning about algorithms. And <clears throat> that kind of set me apart from a lot of my other historian friends who did not care about it at all. Um, so I was able to kind of make a niche for myself, pun intended. And at, at one point in my graduate studies, I was managing like seven different social media platforms for seven different official things. Um, I also worked for the historical GIS lab at the University of Saskatchewan during my graduate studies, which enabled me to learn some WordPress skills as, in addition to what I was doing at Niche and some HGIS digital skills. So um, <clears throat> other than that, I was very self-directed. I just, I kind of, I found this thing that I really love to do and um, I went with it. And uh, I also got to a point in my PhD about the fifth year where my priorities started to change. I started to grow up, I started to become a different person and the things that drove me into academia in the first place were no longer resonating with me. You know, I, I was, you know, the typical, you know, uh, overachiever kid, perfectionist. And, you know, I went into this, this route because, um, that's what I thought I was supposed to do, right? Like I need to be the best, I need to be at my PhD and then, then I'll be a professor and then 
yada, yada, yada. I also went into this route because, you know, I was a poor kid. I have a lot of, you know, I grew up with precarity and I thought this was a route to escaping that. And because I was smart, this was the route I was going to have to take, right? And you kind of realize, oh, that's not actually how these things work. And I, I really struggled to finish my PhD. Um, <clears throat> lots of different things, but um, I, my heart wasn't in it anymore um, in the ways that it was at one point. Uh, you know, I had done all the right things. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so I took seven and a half years to finish my PhD um, for a number of reasons, but part of it was that it was just hard for me to continue to be passionate about it. In 2019, when I graduated, I was in this unique position because I'm an American immigrant and I had to, um, I had, and our application for permanent residency was connected to a provincial scholarship. So we could not leave the province or the city of Saskatoon until our, until our uh, immigration went through. Um, so that gave me some time because I couldn't really apply for jobs or postdocs. And um, so I gave myself this time until the permanent residence came through to kind of figure out what I wanted to do or to like not apply for jobs. And um, when our permanent residency did come through in January 2020, it's like, oh, now I can apply for things. And I not one fiber of my being wanted to. And I was like, well, um, this is like, I need to, I need to figure out what I actually want in life because I don't think this is it. Um, I also have um, disabilities, disabilities, but the most important one is that I have a migraine, severe migraine disability. So last year I had maybe 10 to 15 days without a migraine in the entire year. So at any point during the day, I can be struck down. I cannot see. I need to go lie down for a couple hours. And, you know, that really worried me with nine to five employment or sitting in an office with fluorescent lights every day. And I, I um, yeah, I, I didn't know what to do. I was very nervous. So um, I had all of these skills that I built during my graduate career. And I also had a really broad network. And I sat down with my partners and I said, you know, I think I wanna to try to work for myself. And, you know, do you think, are you willing to, to support me as I get this off the ground? Because I was really afraid of being a burden um, afraid of, you know, a lot of money fears and, um, and they were willing to. And one of the reasons I was able to do this track is because I had, I, can't, I have a three income household and I have people who are willing to support me. So it was okay if I didn't make money for a couple months, right? Um, so I think that's really important to point out that if you are single or you have dependents or um, any other things going on, like this may, you may not even be able to get this off the ground in the same way. Um, <clears throat> so I just went, I just went with it and um, kind of announced this, this is what I was doing. And um, for me, within three months, I was full of contracts and I was starting to turn away work. Um, I haven't even finished my website because I haven't had enough time. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think that's a very unique situation to me. Um, but the reasons that I was able to do that was that I focused on all of these skills during my graduate career, despite my committee and my department asking me to stop because it was not uh, pursue, it wasn't um, directly related to my dissertation, right? So I want <clears throat> people to be, particularly supervisors, to be cognizant of that. But a lot of the deadlines, these neoliberal ideas and stuff that you know, are forced upon graduate students and this, these um, timelines don't necessarily um, help the student um, when they're on the outside, um, particularly if they're wanting to build skills or build their network. Um, again, I, had a very, I have a very big network. I also am very good at sitting down at my desk every day from nine to five. I, I can do it, you know, um, I have the discipline and not everyone has that kind of, that's not the best way that they work or they may have to change it a bit to work for their needs. So that's kind of how I went through it. I kind of had like a, a mid PhD crisis and I came out of it with this. So tips. Firstly, if you're going to try being self-employed and to get contract work, you need to, I think you have to make this, you need to start before you feel ready because we, I don't feel ready still. I still am learning on the go. And if I waited 
to feel like I knew everything about business or I knew everything about keeping track of income, et cetera, before I started, then I, would, I hadn't, wouldn't be started yet. Um, and it's really scary because we aren't given these skills traditionally in the programs that we go through. <clears throat> um, networking is critical. Do, you know, everyone networks in different ways. Do what's comfortable for you, of course. Don't do, th don't do things that are unenjoyable. Um, but every single job that I have gotten has been offered to me. I have not applied for a single thing. I have either been recommended for the job by someone else and then they contact me or the, the employer has direct come up, like contacted me directly. And I was, it's, I was at another workshop for non-academic jobs where they say that only 10% of jobs are gotten on resume alone. So you really need to be making connections, particularly during your graduate years. And that can be overwhelming because again, we're supposed to expect to just be focused on our dissertation, you know? Um, and that's not always going to get us this kind of jobs. Um, thirdly, don't be afraid to publicize yourself. There's a bit of, I find a wariness uh, among other PhDs, like, oh, I don't wanna bother anyone, but I just published a book. Like, yeah, you published a book, that's amazing. You know, like, you have these skills and you need to like let people know that you have them. Um, if I didn't, you know, publicize what I can do, then I wouldn't be getting these job offers. Um, listen to your gut and do what you enjoy. Um, every step of this way, I have, I have gotten over my fears and just been like, this is what I need to do. This is what's right for me. And um, if you're going to be doing self-employment or not academic work and stuff, you know, you really have to like override those, those scripts that we've been given and be like, this is, this is what's right for me and I'm going to do it and I'm going to succeed. <laughs> um, Remember that uh, once you start doing this, your research is going to become secondary for a lot of things. Cause as Alice noted much with like historical consultancy, like I'm doing the work that other people want done, right? And any research or writing that I do is on my own time and not for the most part, not paid. And that can be a bit frustrating cause I would still love to turn my dissertation into a book but I don't know, you know, when or how I'm going to be able to do that. Um, and then lastly, it's a lot of embracing uncertainty and just being just, cause you know, contract work, I've been really lucky for two years, but it could dry up, you know? Or for instance, this past September, no one had any work for me. So I had these contracts, but I basically made nothing because for some reason, every single contract I had that month, that, that month, they didn't have any work for me. So, um, and riding those waves and also, like I'm set to have a baby on June 10th. And um, so I'm gonna have to take a month off. And, you know, it's kind of scary because I don't know what, you know, how my contracts are gonna work with that. If I'm going to be able to build up the same capacity afterwards, um, because I haven't been paying into EI, I can't take um, breaks, uh, uh, maternity leave and stuff. So there's those little factors where you don't know exactly what's going to happen, particularly when you're first starting off. Um, and you kind of have to just take a deep breath and go for it. And if you're not in the position to be able to do that, then you know, be honest with yourself about that too. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for the for my my experience and what I've done. So yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Jessica, for your very honest and for very heartfelt presentation and for um, persisting despite your voice problems. Um, and congratulations on the pregnancy too, of course. Um, our next speaker is Serge Dupuis. Um, uh, Serge a reçu son doctorat de l'Université de Waterloo en 2013. Il est l'autre de cinq livres, <laughs> puis d'une trentaine d'articles et d'essais sur l'histoire de Sudbury, le bilingualisme et les Québécois en Floride. Um, comme travailleur indépendant à Québec, il offre en français ou en anglais des services de recherche, rédaction et consultation en ligne et des projets touchant l'histoire politique, économique et culturelle du Québec, du Canada et de la francophonie nord-américaine. 
Serge Dupuis is a very well-published historian of Francophone North America. He runs a history consulting practice in Quebec City, providing research and writing services for government, community organizations, and business clients. Um, Serge, bienvenue, et uh, je te souhaite uh, prendre la parole. OK, merci de l'invitation. Merci tout le monde d'être là. Je vais faire ma présentation en français, mais bien sûr, sentez-vous à l'aise de poser euh, vos questions euh, en anglais par la suite ou si vous souhaitez obtenir des précisions euh, dans l'autre langue officielle. Ça me fera plaisir de le faire euh, par la suite. Euh, donc, euh, merci à, à Catherine et Will de l'invitation et de la présentation. Euh, je vais essayer de présenter peut-être un peu ce que j'ai euh, ce que j'ai pu faire euh, dans les, les circonstances, moi aussi, j'ai été mené par la passion euh, de, de l'histoire, la passion d'apprendre, mais finalement, j'aimais tous mes cours d'histoire. Euh, puis finalement, ça s'est révélé que j'avais peut-être une contribution à faire euh, en histoire du Canada et plus spécifiquement en histoire franco-ontarienne qui était un, un champ très peu euh, développé. Donc, j'ai certainement été influencé par euh, mon professeur Gaétan Gervais au baccalauréat à l'Université Laurentienne. Par la suite, j'ai fait un, une maîtrise à l'Université d'Ottawa et un doctorat dans le euh, Tri-University Program. Euh, et je le note parce que quand je faisais mon doctorat euh, de 2009 à 2013, les bourses étaient très généreuses. Et ça m'a permis de dégager un petit surplus et de me lancer en entreprise. Donc, c'est grâce à Waterloo et puis euh, euh, aux gens dans le sud-ouest de l'Ontario aussi que j'ai pu euh, avoir la flexibilité de, de, de me lancer puis de, de me donner le temps finalement, de, de me trouver dans, dans cet environnement-là euh, après le post-doctorat, parce que j'ai aussi fait un post-doctorat à l'Université Laval. Euh, donc, j'avais eu assez de succès. J'avais eu des bourses au, au CRSH pour maîtrise, doctorat, post-doc. Euh, j'avais publié deux livres. Donc, j'avais quand même un, un dossier qui était, qui était sérieux. J'ai fait deux entrevues euh, pour des postes à l'université, mais quand on se rend compte qu'on est un parmi 13, 27, 42 candidats, on apprend à pas se fier à ça. Hein? On apprend que finalement, ben, s'il y a 42 candidats, il y a une personne qui va réussir. Il y en a 41 autres qui euh, vont encore se chercher un emploi. Euh, mais je pense qu'il n'y a rien qui nous prépare non plus. Lorsqu'on termine un doctorat, on a connu un certain succès euh, et euh, de se retrouver sans emploi. Euh, on n'est pas prêt mentalement pour ça. On ne fait pas un doctorat pour être pauvre. Euh, on ne fait pas un doctorat pour avoir des difficultés financières ou pour euh, peiner à se placer euh, dans le monde du travail. Euh, et dans mon cas aussi, euh, ma conjointe venait de quitter son emploi, on allait avoir un enfant, donc il fallait que je trouve une solution euh, à court, à moyen terme, de, de préférence à court terme. Euh, la chance que j'ai eue dans mon cas, euh, c'est que parfois c'est ça, il faut, faut laisser l'environnement, nous révéler des choses, euh, c'est que j'avais un bon réseau. Puis je pense que Herward, euh, Alice et Jessica ont tous mentionné ça un peu. L'idée que euh, finalement, on pouvait faire du travail euh, en employant des démarches qu'on connaissait avec des outils, des, une historiographie qu'on connaît, mais euh, avec d'autres personnes qui pourraient avoir des besoins historiques, entre guillemets. Euh, et puis, euh, c'est la raison pour laquelle euh, j'ai fini par obtenir des contrats euh, sans que je les cherche euh, à la fin du postdoc. Euh, le mot s'est passé que, que j'étais disponible et puis euh, on m'a proposé euh, du travail. Puis pendant au moins un an, j'ai travaillé sans chercher euh, d'ouvrage. Euh, puis ça, ça a vraiment été formidable. Ça m'a donné la confiance de me dire peut-être que je peux faire fonctionner ça. Continuer de travailler dans un milieu académique aussi. Hein publier dans des revues scientifiques, que ce soit la revue d'histoire d'Amérique française ou de recherche sociographique, ou, euh, ou de publier des livres avec des maisons d'édition avec lesquelles je travaillais, avec le Septentrion à Québec ou euh, prise de parole à, à Sudbury. Euh, je dirais que pour l'aspect recherche et écriture, euh, c'est un outil qui s'est euh, développé, qui s'est euh, raffiné avec le temps, mais je pense que j'avais la base. Euh, de toute façon, on dit souvent que Faire une maîtrise, ça nous apprend à lire, puis au doctorat, on apprend à écrire. C'est un, un peu ça, d'une certaine façon. C'est qu'on apprend, à, 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 les outils sont là, euh, mais on s'améliore avec le temps parce qu'on a plus d'expérience, on peut écrire plus rapidement. Il y a une clarté euh, qui, euh, qui, euh, qui vient avec la perspective. Je pense que le défi dans euh, l'histoire à contrat, c'est plutôt que euh, ben, on n'a pas nécessairement des aptitudes en affaires. Comment quantifier? Combien de temps ça prend à écrire un livre? Euh, combien de temps ça prend à écrire un article? Euh, et, et, et si oui, à quel taux? Euh, parce que ce qu'on peut vous proposer peut 
et ne pas être très généreux, euh, franchement. On peut euh, offrir un contrat d'étudiant à quelqu'un qui a un PhD et qui a cinq ans euh, d'ouvrage. Euh, les charges de cours ne sont pas très bien payées non plus. Euh, donc, ça aussi, c'est du travail qui n'est pas très appétissant. Puis, je vois plusieurs de mes collègues qui finissent par lâcher, euh, qui n'arrivent pas à se situer dans cet environnement-là, qui se disent, ben, finalement, je perds ma chemise, euh, j'ai accepté d'écrire un livre pour 20 000 et ça m'a pris un an et demi, et puis voilà, il a fallu que je me trouve un employeur. Et, et on perd ces gens-là du milieu de la recherche. Donc, je, je n'allais pas accepter ce sort-là, puis d'une certaine façon, euh, j'étais incapable de faire autre chose, d'une certaine façon. Je ne voulais pas être fonctionnaire euh, et je ne voulais pas euh, vivre de précarité. Donc, je devais trouver des solutions. Euh, puis, il y a des choses qui me sont venues en partie en, en, en baignant dans ce milieu-là. Euh, à quel moment est-ce qu'on veut parler d'histoire? Avec qui est-ce que j'ai envie de travailler? Comment faire financer les projets? Quel taux facturer? Comment quantifier euh, les projets? Je pense qu'il y a une réponse pour chaque personne, parce qu'il n'y a personne qui travaille de la même façon. Euh, et on doit le quantifier. Donc, moi, je travaille dans les documents Word, oui, mais j'ai toujours trois, quatre ou cinq fichiers Excel aussi où je minute mon travail. Donc, je peux vous dire que écrire un livre, pour moi, en moyenne, c'est 1200 heures. C'est 1200 heures. C est, c est, je vous dirais que c'est parfois un peu plus, parfois un peu moins, mais on est dans ces eaux-là. C'est un an de travail. Écrire un article scientifique, c'est deux à trois mois de travail. Donc, si on prend ça, puis si on pense qu'on mériterait un salaire qui ressemblerait à celui d'un prof, bien, on divise un an par quatre ou par cinq, incluons les bénéfices puis la pension et tout ça. Et puis, on peut, le, le, le taux horaire peut s'expliquer à ce, ce moment-là. Ça dépend aussi combien d'expérience qu'on a, c'est-à-dire quand on sort du doctorat, on ne va pas facturer la même chose que lorsqu'on a dix ans d'expérience en consultation, mais il y a du, euh, du travail de, de pédagogie à faire. Puis, en fait, on va se rendre compte que les gens qui vont dire que, par exemple, le travail de recherche historique ne vaut pas 30 ou 40 dollars de l'heure, c'est souvent des clients qui ne sont pas très bons non plus parce qu'ils ne sont pas respectueux du travail qu'on est capable de faire. Euh, J'en ai déjà eu un qui me disait, euh, Serge, 100 de l'heure, ce n'est pas assez. Euh, si tu veux qu'on te prenne au sérieux, il faut, faut que tu demandes plus que ça. Donc, il y a vraiment là, toute une gamme. C'est un peu le Wild West, là, comme euh, Jessica le décrivait, c'est qu'on dit... On, on ne sait pas à quoi s'attendre. Il faut, faut, faut arriver avec une explication qui est recevable. Euh, mais aussi de présenter un projet qui, euh, euh, qui est adapté aux moyens financiers qu'a qu 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 le client. Bien, si on a seulement quelques centaines de dollars, bien, est mieux, je suis mieux d'être en train de réchauffer un sujet parce que je pourrais y mettre quelques heures puis vous présenter une conférence sur un sujet euh, sur lequel j'ai déjà fait de la recherche. Ça, ça va. Si vous voulez que je fasse de la recherche spécifique sur votre organisation ou sur une loi comme telle, par exemple, euh, bien, vous avez quelles sont vos ressources. Puis dans, à ce moment-là, on va se développer un budget. Puis je vais vous dire, bien, je pourrais me rendre à cette profondeur ici avec ce budget-là. Euh, on peut faire ça par étapes aussi. Donc, parfois, je vais, je vais trancher un projet de livre en 7-8 étapes. Puis je vais leur dire, bien, écoutez, on va faire une première recherche préliminaire dans l'historiographie. On va faire une recherche essentielle aussi à partir de, je ne sais pas, des rapports annuels. Puis par la suite, si vous voulez continuer, on peut aller voir dans la presse, on peut faire des entrevues ici et de suite, en donnant la chance aux clients de tirer la plug, là, entre guillemets, et dire, bien, OK, si c'est fini ou il n'y a plus de fond, on peut le euh, faire comme ça. Euh, moi, j'ai appris aussi à me familiariser avec les programmes de subvention qui pouvaient euh, permettre à des organisations qui n'ont pas beaucoup de moyens de m'embaucher, notamment à l'occasion d'anniversaires. Je vous dirais dans mon cas, parce que je pratique l'histoire du 20e siècle principalement, euh, à l'occasion de 50e ou de 100e anniversaire d'une loi, d'une organisation, euh, d'une euh, fête quelconque, euh, à ce moment-là, on va vouloir parler d'histoire. Mais il ne faut pas le faire au moment du 50e, il faut prévoir 3, 4, 5 ans à l'avance euh, cet anniversaire-là et prévoir une rencontre exploratoire. Euh, Peut-être à l'inverse de Jessica, je n'ai pas la, la même chance. En fait, la majorité de mes projets encore aujourd'hui, je les développe. C'est-à-dire que euh, je lance une idée. J'ai remarqué que vous avez un anniversaire qui s'en vient. Euh, Est-ce que ça pourrait vous intéresser d'en de, apprendre davantage sur votre histoire? Euh, je dirais deux fois sur trois, ça finit par être un oui. Mais il faut être extrêmement flexible aussi dans euh, la vitesse à laquelle ça va se réaliser, euh, le budget qu'on va nous, nous proposer d'abord euh, et la démarche pour, euh, pour faire financer le projet. 
Ça, c'est vraiment le nerf de la guerre, puis je dirais c'est la différence. Alors que je maintiens finalement un pied à l'université parce que je suis membre associé à, à la CFAN de l'Université Laval. Euh, je collabore avec des professeurs. Je me fais évaluer par euh, des professeurs quand je soumets mes travaux à des revues scientifiques ou à des, 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 des maisons d'édition. Euh, mais euh, j'ai besoin de euh, me poser la question du financement avant, avant que je réalise puis que je développe euh, le projet. Euh, donc, je dirais en amont, il y a une différence. Pour le travail de recherche et d'écriture, je dirais bien franchement, c'est c'est mieux qu'un poste de prof d'une certaine façon parce que je n'ai pas la distraction de l'administration puis de l'enseignement. Puis je dis ça gentiment, c'est magnifique, ça me manque l'enseignement. Mais d'une certaine façon, je, moi, je peux, je peux passer 80 de mon temps dans l'année à faire de la recherche et de l'écriture. Euh, alors que souvent, les professeurs vont me dire, bien, on a des rencontres, on enseigne, on fait de l'évaluation et parfois, on fait de la recherche. Et puis parfois, c'est... Moi, moi, en fait, c'est l'inverse. C'est que parfois, je fais de l'administration, parfois, je fais euh, des, des, euh, des, des, des rencontres euh, académiques. Donc, d'une certaine façon, je suis choyé à ce, cette partie-là de la recherche. À la toute fin, je pense que l'autre partie, c'est lorsqu'on travaille sur un sujet et le sujet est aussi le client, euh, il peut y avoir une invitation à la complaisance. Ça, je vais le dire tout de suite. Même une invitation à la censure. Mais je vous dirais que ça arrive assez rarement, puis c'est sur des points vraiment très spécifiques parfois. Puis là, il faut savoir naviguer tout ça, puis vraiment avoir une intégrité, je pense, assez forte pour dire, oh, oh, ouais. quand on choisit un sujet, euh, on le choisit par, euh, par affection, d'une certaine façon. Si on veut travailler sur quelque chose pendant un an, c'est parce qu'on trouve que c'est important, on trouve ça intéressant. Il y a de la mise en valeur là-dedans, euh, mais on ne fait pas de procès et on ne fait pas de propagande. Euh, puis moi, je dis souvent aux organisations, vous pouvez vous inspirer de mes recherches pour faire de la promotion euh, par la suite. Mais ce n'est pas moi qui vais vous, vous l'écrire, votre texte de promotion. Euh, C'est vous qui allez le faire. Moi je, moi, je dois assumer tout ce que je dis euh, et ça doit être de qualité égale à ce qui se produit à l'université. Euh, parce qu'on peut, on, on peut acheter le travail, mais on n'achète pas la conclusion. Euh, mais je, je suis toujours ouvert aussi. Puis honnêtement, quand les clients souvent ont des hésitations, ils ont souvent raison. Raison sur le problème, pas nécessairement sur la solution. Donc, c'est à nous, finalement, de prendre ce qui est soulevé comme un problème. Souvent, c'est un problème de documentation. On a manqué une perspective. On ne l'a pas prise en compte. Et honnêtement, dans une démarche honnête, historienne, c'est qu'il faut prendre en compte une diversité de points de vue, une diversité d'approche, euh, être à l'aise avec l'inconnu, être à l'aise avec... Euh, euh, la recherche qui, qui va avoir besoin d'être faite à l'avenir pour préciser notre compréhension du passé, des dynamiques du passé. Euh, donc, j'arrive toujours à trouver des solutions avec lesquelles, éthiquement, moralement, je peux euh, vivre que, euh, et, et c'est un résultat de qualité égale. Je dis bien de qualité égale et non pas identique à ce qu'on verrait à l'université parce que le projet n'aurait pas évolué de la même façon si je n'avais pas eu à sécuriser le financement au départ. Puis, si je n'étais pas en train de travailler avec une communauté. Mais, en même temps, quand on fait l'histoire d'une famille et on a accès à des archives privées, c'est une histoire qui ne se serait peut-être pas trouvée dans l'espace public non plus. Donc, d'une certaine façon, on, on, on obtient euh, des histoires euh, riches au travail du secteur privé qui sont de qualité égale, même si, c'est ça, le résultat, euh, forcément, ne sera pas exactement pareil parce que on va avoir été accompagné et on va avoir accompagné un, euh, un, un client dans la, la découverte et la mise en valeur de son histoire. Euh, donc, je ne sais pas combien de minutes il me reste. Je pense que j'ai probablement parlé les dix minutes. Euh, je vais m'arrêter là pour l'instant, mais je tenais à vous présenter un petit peu l'espèce le, de, de monde hybride dans lequel je suis en train de, de fonctionner puis travailler puis qui euh, peut être une possibilité pour d'autres personnes aussi. Euh, qui, ont, qui ont envie de, euh, de l'aventure. Euh, merci beaucoup. Thanks so much. Merci beaucoup, Serge. Um, et je suis désolé pour les francophones. Je sais, les, les traductions étaient seulement de français en anglais, mais, mais bon. Um, that's the limit of my skills, I think, going quickly to French to English and not the other way around. So I think you did a good job. <laughs> um, shifting to our, our fifth panelist here. We have uh, Marion Toledo Candelaria, who holds a PhD from the University of Guelph, which was received in 2018. Uh, she is a historian of medieval Scotland, 
and her dissertation looked at four centuries worth of literary representations of King Malcolm III Canmore, who ruled in the second half of the 11th century. She is now yes. the program manager of the Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship for Diversity, Inclusion, and Cultural Heritage at the Rare Book School in Charlottesville, Virginia. Marianne Toledo Candelaria est une historienne de l'Écosse médiévale et est présentement directrice de programme de la bourse Andrew W. Mellon pour la diversité, l'inclusion et la culture offerte par l'École des livres en Charlottesville, Virginie. Marianne, we're delighted to have you here. Take it away. Thank you so much. So I'm going to share my screen now with you all. Hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me to talk today. Um, I'm the program manager of the Andrew W. Mellon Fellowship for Diversity, Inclusion, and Cultural Heritage at Rare Book School, um, which is located at the University of Virginia. Um, Rare Book School was founded in 1983 at Columbia University, um, and it has been at uh, UVA since 1992. Basically, we are an institute to provide training in book history and bibliographical um, fields to um, professionals um, who work in those fields and to graduate students. So um, as you will see, this has absolutely nothing to do with what I did my PhD on. But before that, um, I would like to um, take some time to do a land acknowledgement. Um, Rare Book School is located on the traditional lands of the Monacan people who lived in Charlottesville, Albemarle County, Virginia, before the arrival of European colonizers and who are the traditional custodians of the land in which we live and work. Let us also acknowledge the 4,000 enslaved persons who built the foundation and wealth of the University of Virginia and the 607 persons enslaved by its founder, Thomas Jefferson, Many of their descendants live in Charlottesville and work at the university, grappling with the painful legacy that slavery has left in the history of Virginia and of the United States. And if you would like a little bit more information on the Monacan Indian Nation of Virginia and slavery at uh, Monticello by Thomas Jefferson or um, at the University of Virginia, I include some links here. But then moving to what is my career path, um, yeah, that's a very, uh, it's, it's a bit of a running joke because I never expected in my life to do a PhD, much less to hold the position that I have right now. And um, I did a map um, and I kind of laugh a little bit um, when I looked at it, but um, basically this is a oversimplification of um, what I've done in my career so far. I started with a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Fashion Design. And um, as you can see, well, that didn't happen. Um, I would preface my career by saying that I had plans and then that they never worked. So um, I have a, I've built a career of um, career plans that have not really gone to plan. Um, but um, I, I did um, move to the UK from Puerto Rico, where I'm originally from, um, in 2008 to do a graduate diploma with um, the intention of doing a master's degree in fashion. Um, that didn't happen. Um, I actually got rejected to all the masters in fashion that I applied to. So I ended up at King's College London doing an MA in medieval studies. I literally winked it. I've never heard of the university. I didn't know you could do you know, medieval studies as a subject. I had no clue, no idea. And it was while doing my MA that I learned that you could do a PhD without having children or a husband or a career. That was new to me um, because in Puerto Rico, everyone I knew who, who were working on PhDs only did it part-time at the University of Puerto Rico after they had careers and after they had families. So that was mind blown by the end of it. I was convinced I wanted to do a PhD, but um, my father died. So I returned to Puerto Rico to take care of my family. And there I had my professional, uh, my first professional experiences. I worked um, as an adjunct 
where I did my undergrad um, teaching fashion. Uh, I started volunteering at La Casa del Libro, which is a um, rare book um, museum in Puerto Rico. Um, I also adjuncted for a specific program very shortly at the University of Puerto Rico. I worked in as a, a fashion instructor at a, a private uh, fashion school. So um, a lot of bits and bobs, if you will, but by the time I had applied for a PhD, I already knew what I liked doing and what I didn't like doing, and I had professional experience. And I think that really makes a difference because it gives you uh, a different outlook on, on how to deal with, with that um, post-PhD professional uh, development, right? So in 2013, I moved to Canada to do the PhD in Guelph, and I knew that academia was um, a difficult one to get into, right? Um, I knew that I was doing a very specialized subject in a very specialized field. I knew that probably my chances were, were small of having an academic career, but I was like, you know what? I'm gonna start looking for opportunities to do other things where, where I can you know, keep building my CV with Canadian experience. Um, because I thought that that was important to have experiences beyond my PhD where I could say to an employer, a Canadian employer, yes, I, I actually know how to work in Canada in Ontario. Um, and I would say that was one of the best things I did because when I defended my PhD in 2018, um, my first post PhD jobs had nothing to do with having a PhD. Um, actually, out of all the things I did um, before the funding, I was like, okay, um, the one field I know that I don't really like that much is publishing. So obviously I got a job in publishing, uh, as you will. So um, I was hired as marketing assistant at Wilfrid Laurier University Press, um, a job that didn't require a university degree. And I was hired because I had design experience and training. Um, if, if you wanted to hear a funny joke as well. So I learned so much out of that job. And I think that this is one of the bigger lessons from, from embarking in a post PhD non-academic career is to really open yourself to different opportunities. You don't know what you like until you try it. And if I'd been like, oh, I don't wanna do you know, publishing, I'm not going to apply to this job, I would have missed out on a great opportunity to develop, you know, uh, soft skills dealing with um, authors and, and people from different backgrounds, learning about indigenous studies, learning how to communicate with broader audiences, learning how to manage social media for, for an academic publisher or for a company, you know, and these are skills that I've brought into my current role that I didn't learn as part of my PhD. Once um, the, I was, I was at Wilfrid Laurier University Press for about a year and a half uh, on a contract. And once that, that was up, I found another position at the Writing and Communication Center as a writing, um, as a writing instructor. And, there, I really saw the, the difficulties that international students, and I was an international student as well, but the difficulties that international students encounter when doing their degrees in Canada, right? Um, those issues, uh, that intersection between race, um, ethnicity, um, academic expectations, especially North American, Anglophone academic expectations was something that I had to learn how to help students deal with all these issues and navigate all these uh, expectations. And that's really what prefer, prepared me for the role I have now at Rare Book School, for which um, I started in uh, February 2021. So um, for my role um, here, what I do is that I manage the daily operations of a six-year program a fellowship that sees 45 professionals from around the United States uh, who work in cultural heritage, who are early to mid-career. 
And we provide opportunities for training, for developing projects, uh, funding for these 45 professionals throughout the fellowship. And um, we help then, all of them are um, either um, from underrepresented communities or work with underrepresented communities and they work with special collections and archives and rare books and you know cultural heritage more broadly defined. So um, I um, part of the things that I do include liaising with the fellows of whom only a small minority have PhDs. Most of them have their MLIS or Masters in Library Science. Um, I liaise with um, collaborators and um, advisors um, to the program. I liaise with people who do have PhDs and, and other experts. And I organized activities um, for the fellows. Uh, these include a, an orientation, which happened at the beginning of April, and uh, field schools that they need to take as part of the program. And we had one to New York City in mid-March. So um, as you can see, there has nothing to do with Malcolm III and nothing to do with Scottish history. And I think that at least in my experience, it really helps to leverage every opportunity you can get. Um, so I just wanna take a, a bit of a different route and talk a little bit more about what did I do? And this list is not exhaustive, but for me, this is what I think set my experience apart. Um, for me, um, especially not coming from initially an academic background, not having a, you know, kind of like linear um, professional development, if you will, um, it was very important for me to be financially stable as, um, as a person of color who doesn't come from a privileged background and who was an immigrant in Canada and in the UK, I know how difficult it is to really think about how to make yourself stable. Um, you have to determine your priorities and interest early. Um, and yes, we are, we are, we're all historians here, so we all love doing research, right? But, you know, necessarily um, saying I want to do research is not necessarily something that can be immediately seen in a job, you know. So when it comes to me, what are my priorities and interests? For example, I really like um, collaborating with others and I really like meeting people. And I think that a lot of the soft skills and um, cultural awareness that I have developed as an immigrant and as the result of having to really um, fend for myself professionally have been a really big asset in my post PhD career. And in terms of interests, I knew that I didn't want to be jumping from postdoc to postdoc. Um, I knew that eventually I wanted to move closer to my family. So all of these things had to be factored in into what it is that I want to do after the PhD. Um, Something that has also helped me is to just tell absolutely everyone you know you're interested in not academic jobs. Scream it from every single rooftop you can find, say it on social media. I know that um, for some people, um, they, have, they are in departments or have supervisors that are not as um, supportive. I'm really lucky that we were in a position in Guelph where I did have that support. So I felt very comfortable telling my supervisor what it is that I wanted to do. And she was 100% supportive and very helpful. Um, the third one, get a mentor. So um, this one, or mentors, um, this one for me was um, very, very, very useful. Um, I worked in several projects with um, Melissa McAfee, who's Special Collections Librarian at Guelph, and everyone who's at Guelph history knows that Melissa is amazing. Um, and working with those projects that had to do with special collections and, and archives uh, meant that Melissa has served as a mentor to me in addition to my supervisor, Elizabeth Ewan. And she was the one who um, really uh, pushed and guided me towards, you know, if I want to go back to special collections and archives, this is what I need to do. Um, and when I was ready to transition, to make that decision after um, I was at the University of Waterloo, I went to Melissa. 
And she told me, you know, do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, it worked really well. Um, the fourth uh, thing that I did was network like crazy. Um, you know, I, you, I think, uh, you know, uh, the rest of the panelists have really alluded to this. We tend to be a bit coy in history. We don't want to promote ourselves. But this is your opportunity to really think about it not as networking, but as meet people and become interested in who they are and what they do. It's very simple, you know, and it doesn't have to be, you know, cold emailing people. It can easily be like, hey, you know, do you know anyone who's doing so and so? I'd be interested in knowing, you know, how how things in publishing works or, or, you know, I'd be interested in this job as a librarian or I'd be interested in this job in marketing. You know, it's just getting, leveraging the people you already know and, and asking them for, for advice or to introduce you to other people. And then the fifth one, I think it's super important as academics, we are trained to do application materials that are very, very long. And um, when you're out in industry and non-academic jobs, if your application materials can pass a peer review on their own, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> so you really want to start learning how it is that resumes and cover letters work, especially if you are um, moving to a field where most of the people doing the hiring do not have PhDs. So um, when uh, the pandemic hit in March, 2020, I was um, ready to, to move into special collections and, and archives. And because I had worked in Puerto Rico at La Casa del Libro as a curator, and I worked with these rare books before the PhD, I knew that kind, that kind of job was very suitable to me and I really enjoyed doing it. So by the time I finally made the decision to move to special collections and archives, um, I emailed my mentor, Melissa McAfee. Hey, Melissa, um, I think I'm doing, I'm doing that MLIS. I'm doing that master's degree, right? And she's like, okay, so sign up for RBMS. RBMS is their rare books and manuscript section of the American Library Association. She sent me a link to a mentorship program they have, and I did both things. And I took that time while I was working at the University of Waterloo to really prepare myself to, to move from field yet again. Um, I signed up for the mentorship program. I was assigned a really fantastic mentor um, who's at Harvard. And ironically, she's one of our new fellows in the program. So there you go doing networks. Um, she also advised me a lot. Um, and I started going to every single um, Zoom activities that RBMS put. Uh, and I started showing my face and I started saying, you know, I'm a writing uh, and communication specialist, but I'm looking to move into this field. And people were very, very helpful, very, very accepting. Um, if you fast forward about eight months, um, an advert for the position that I have now came up. I applied for it um, five days after the deadline. <laughs> um, and I got an interview less than 24 hours later, um, which was really great because I was struggling getting interviews in Canada, um, really struggling getting interviews in Ontario for anything. Um, I interviewed it. Uh, for this job and I did not get it. Um, and once I um, continue on what you would be my pre master's degree professional development plan, Melissa was who messaged me and say, hey, this position came up and you don't need an MLIS. And I looked at her, it's like, oh my God, that's that position that I didn't get. So I applied for it again and I actually got it. And I think three weeks later, I was in Virginia, relocated in the middle of a pandemic. Um, haven't looked back. It's pretty great. And um, I think that um, giving yourself those opportunities is, is really what has made the difference for me. Um, and, and I think that 
from these steps that I said, none of them are in a specific order. I would say probably the first one. And, and determining um, where you want to go after the PhD can be a very daunting step. And sometimes you really don't know until you take one or two jobs afterwards. I think it's also important to say that you don't have to marry to the first you know, post PhD job you have. It might not be the first one. Um, you might find out it's not a good fit for you or that field is really not where you want to be the rest of your professional career. You will probably have different careers at different points in your life. And to give yourself the opportunity to continue assessing who you are professionally at specific points in time, I think it's very um, important in terms of assessing what it is that you need and where do you want to go as a professional. So for me, the advantages or disadvantages of having a PhD, uh, <laughs> and again, this is my, my own experience. Um, some employers prefer hiring people with PhDs in certain fields. Um, in my experience, only if the hiring manager had a PhD or were at least ABD or, or had the experience of being in a PhD program, I got interviews. Otherwise, in Ontario, I didn't get interviews with anybody who, who was not familiar with, with working with PhDs. Um, the other thing I would say it's a really big advantage for me as a, as a woman of color is that having a PhD, having that title, uh, lends me credibility and it does give me a, a seat at the table, if you will. And I know that in, in many instances, I probably wouldn't have that seat at the table have I not have a PhD you know, title to go along with my name. And for disadvantages, I, <laughs> like I said, this is personal. Um, this might not be the same for everyone else, but for me, I felt it was a big disadvantage. Um, initially out of the PhD, I probably submitted like 70 applications before I got one interview maybe two. Um, my first position didn't require a university degree. This position that I'm in right now um, requires uh, a bachelor's. So I none of the positions I applied for really required a PhD. Um, and something that um, an article from University Affairs did highlight uh, in, back in 2016 is how the Canadian market really doesn't produce as many PhDs as other comparable countries. And what that means is that people are less familiarized with having PhDs as colleagues, as co-workers, as you know, people they report to outside of you know, academic fields. So that puts you at a disadvantage as well. I hate to sound negative, but I like to think that I'm a realist. So I like putting things out there. Um, and um, yeah, like I said, those are my experiences. Nothing here is gospel. Um, but um, I do want to say that um, if you have any questions, I'm always happy to, to hear from people. So here's my email address should you need me. And I wanna thank you again, uh, Catherine and Will for extending the invitation for today. And you know, I look forward to questions. Thank you so much, Marianne. You've, you've had such an interesting pathway through all of this. So it's amazing to hear about all of your different experiences. Um, I'm pulling a question from the, the chat because they've been coming in as, 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 as you've been talking um, that maybe any of you could answer. Um, and it's one of the things that our committee has been thinking about as well, which is, you know, what could your PhD program have done better to prepare you for the kinds of jobs that you're in now? Serge, tu veux commencer? Oui. Um... I would say that there's an opportunity in PhD to become experts of project management in a certain way. You're managing a huge project. And uh, at the Tri University program, the idea was that they wanted to try to get us to do it within four years. Um, I, I did, uh, but I was very disciplined. Um, and I think that um, that just wasn't talked about amongst our, our colleagues. And I, I'd see some colleagues take six, seven, even 11 years to finish a PhD. 
And in the business world, you know, it, that, that seems crazy that you would need an extra year, extra years to finish a PhD, uh, but it's commonplace. So how do we, um, how do we become efficient researchers? Uh, how do you write uh, efficiently? How do you get a first draft to get an idea of what you're doing? And then that your next version is your final draft, the one that you're going to submit. Um, and I know that a lot of professors take a lot of time to figure that one out, or some never do. Um, but I know that that was really a useful skill that I learned at, well during, but after the PhD. And I think that it would have been useful that we uh, look at that and say, well, okay, if, if the goal is to get this within four years and to be efficient project managers, uh, how are we going to do this? How are we going to develop skills so that we can uh, provide results within, uh, you know, reasonable uh, deadlines? So Serge's answer um, kind of is pro PhD because Stephen High is asking uh, on the job market, do you even do the PhD? Maybe an MA is enough. So Alice and Harward, I know you're interested in the hiring and, and Jessica probably may have a comment too, but PhD or MA, what do you feel about that? I would say, yes, I saw that, that question come in. Um, I think that at, speaking at least for, for our firm, um, we welcome PhD um, applications from, from PhDs. It will not necessarily translate into a different job than someone with a master's, but um, I think there is an appreciation for the skill set that comes from that extra degree in terms of like what, what Serge was touching on the project management side of things, um, a more dedicated time for writing and research skills and that skills development. Um, I think there is an appreciation for, for that side of it as well. Yeah, I think it, it, it kind of cuts both ways. Um, it can be, uh, you know, I, I think ultimately like you need to be, um, you need to be have all your business skills and your um, and your industry specific skills dialed, and that's way 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 more important. Like my, uh, you know, my manager runs a team of like you know almost 30, 40 people, and uh, she's got a BA. And I think it's because she never needed any more um, education because she was so good right out of the gate. So um, that said, though, like having a PhD definitely gives you um, a degree of uh, authority in certain situations. Like I've definitely been. And like not included my letters on uh, reports and stuff. I mean, like, where's your, where's your letters? You need, we need all your letters. Like, we need to hit them with as many letters as we can. So, um, so sometimes that that can be really valuable. It, it gives you access to higher level things like expert witness work and stuff like that. Um, it, it's kind of like something that can be an, an excellent complement. And at the highest levels, it's really uh, it's really important. But um, I think uh, getting a master's though is like absolutely not absolutely mandatory, but like you see a lot of people who get into the into the workforce with a BA trying to find, figure out how to get masters later on. And so like, especially like advising students, like advising students to like hammer out a masters as fast as possible before looking anywhere else. And then the PhD is definitely, it's like, if you have a viable other option, like it might not be worth the time, but if you have a good project and good funding, then like, um, and go for it, I don't know. I'm aware that we're we're at time and I'm not sure if all of our panelists can stay with us for an extra 10 minutes, but um, we can stay online for an extra 10 minutes if people are willing to if people have more questions. Um, are people, um, so if you, if you need to go, just go, we completely understand. Um, and, but if you can, you can stay. I know that there are a few more questions in the, the chat. Um, and maybe Alice, can you can you stay for an extra few minutes? Because the next question I was going to ask was for you. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so, how much of an advantage do you think it is to um, like have a PhD? You know, you have a PhD in Scottish history, um, but for those kinds of research firms that you know know history is is a part of, you know, is it is considerably more of an advantage to have a Canadian? history PhD, or is it more important just to have the historical skill set? I think speaking to my kind of personal experience getting into to the job market, um, it, it is certainly easier if you have a more relatable um, subject area. 
Um, I know that some of the time when we're hiring, we're looking for people who can fill specific roles or specific types of contracts, maybe with an expertise in a, in a specific area or with a specific First Nation. Um, and so that's something that, that we're always looking for. And so obviously studying early modern Scottish history, um, that was not, not the case for me, but I was able to um, speak more to kind of the digital humanities side of things. Um, and that was an advantage for the specific historical research firm that I was applying to. Um, there was someone else who did social network analysis and they were looking for people with that skill set um, to work on projects. And so um, I would say it's definitely an advantage to have um, a, a very easily relatable, um, leverageable um, expertise. Uh, area of expertise, but it's not kind of the end of the list. There are definitely other ways in which you can get your foot in the door. Mm -hmm. And Jessica, just out of curiosity, how would you answer that question? Because it seemed like maybe your specific skill set was is it was in the sort of digital side of things. Yeah, um, I mean, for for both niche, obviously, and white cap, my understanding of Canadian history has been critical. Um, but for my other jobs, I think it's the skill set and also just a general humanity skill set. Um, for instance, working with the Medical College of Georgia, it's helping people who speak science communicate to a broader pu public and people trained in humanities are um, and, you know, absolutely no one has cared that I'm a park historian yet, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to get a contract down the line that is looking just for that, you know, so, yeah. Hannah also has a question here about, I guess, first steps of how do you open up a career path without making it too overwhelming? And I know you alluded to that, Marion. So, um, you know, further, do you have further advice on how to just open things up a little bit without being overwhelmed with the possibilities, and this is for, for any panelist. Um, I, I maybe had a different experience where I found that uh, because I'm still doing a lot of research in my field or connected fields, um, I found that not only the PhD um, inspires trust when you're trying to propose a project and you can demonstrate, well, I've published these books or these articles or I've worked on this topic, uh, so, so you know, you can trust me, I know how to do this. Um, and also it opens up to a certain network. And again, when I'm saying that I have foot in, a foot in both worlds, um, you know different professors, you know where to find the historiography. So in a way, um, you know, clients will often want their uh, article or their book or their website to be uh, respectable, that it'd be a good result um, and that it will be re well received and that their history will be well depicted but you know in an objective manner that's why they come to see you in a way um and, and to make sure that they won't say that, that 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 the work will be done correctly so i found it was a short-term disadvantage for sure because when when you're looking for jobs there are more jobs for ma uh, graduates for sure than for phd but i should say in the middle or the long term i found it to be actually quite useful because it's um, allowed me to develop, de develop a brand in a way. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm doing research on some things that I, I wouldn't have done research on in the PhD, but it's connected. It stays connected. The core stays uh, similar and I've continued to deepen that, that expertise in a way. So maybe we'll take this moment to, to conclude. Um, for those of you who are willing, I know quite a few put your, your uh, emails up on your slides, but if you're willing to be contacted by other participants, maybe you can also put your email in the, the chat right now. Um, thank you so much to everyone. I learned a ton <laughs> from this. I hope um, everyone else uh, did as well. It's fascinating to hear what different paths you've all taken and actually what different things you're all doing um, was really was really fascinating to me. And I, I can see it's sort of the corner of my eye that there's tons of thank yous as well coming in through the through the chat. So we really appreciate your your time today. And um, yeah, thank you so much for such invigorating presentations. Will, do you have any final comments? No, oh, thank you. It was terrific. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone.